Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day three of USAS R Basics. We'll be recording this session just like the other ones this week, and you'll be able to find that on the training and registration page where you registered for this session. We'll take a break about 1015 so we can stretch and not get any Zoom fatigue. Feel free to ask questions or send us a chat and we'll do our best to answer your questions. So today we are going to be going over reports in general, utility menu, and any miscellaneous topics at the end. So in the system, there's a lot of um, items below the report menu, and then we'll be going over the utilities as well. So the report tab includes report bundles, the report manager, a custom report creator, and then these five reports down below are considered canned reports. The reports under the report manager or those listed here on the home page are considered template reports. And I'm going to go out of order and skip the report bundles and show you after I show you reports. So yesterday, Amanda went through the periodic reports like the five-year forecast, but there are also template reports that I told you about found either on the home page or under the report manager. When districts are new to the system, they're probably only going to see the SSDT created by template reports, which you see all start with SSDT. Um, and you also notice that there is like no BUDSUM acronym. It's spelled out SSDT budget summary. So since there's a, a lot of them and a lot of acronyms um, from classic, we do have a crosswalk in the wiki. So under reports, there is uh, like a PDF version here that you can download and print. However, I like using the wiki and I'll show you why. If you click on that, it lists all the reports, but if you click on here, you get this grid with a new redesign name. I'll go down to the budget summary. The classic BUDSUM name and a description. And that's for all the reports that's listed under the report manager that starts with SSDT. The other reason why I like using the wiki as opposed to that printout is you can click on this and it brings you to uh, a screenshot of what the report looks like. This shows what it looks like in Excel. It gives you a little bit more description. And again, it's like that for all the reports. We'll go back to the report manager grid. You notice at the top, there are like five reports that are created by admin, which would be the support staff. Those are customized reports um, that probably started with the SSDT template reports. And I'm gonna show you that, how to customize that as well today. You also notice the different icons between the customized report and the SSDT report. Both can download or generate when you come to like the screen to generate the report. I'll go through that in a moment. Both can view
And this is what we're going to be working with later. The difference comes in with edit. So I'm going to go into a SSDT budget summary. And you can only update a tag. This could be, if I move this out of the way, you can see that these reports are tagged for like AR accounts receivable type reports. And these are tagged as audit reports. You can do month end, you can do budget, you can name the tag anything you want. You just can't change the SSDT name until you take it and customize it. Now, when you open up a customized report and edit it, you can do more than just the tag. You can update your name of the report or the description of the report and as well add a tag. So customized reports are a little bit more, you can customize them more. You cannot delete, this would be the icon to delete. Can't delete SSDT reports. You can delete, <clears throat> excuse me, custom reports. You can download re the report definition, and these can be used to share your report that you created with another treasurer or another ITC. And what you would do is download it. Um, sorry, I was on the wrong icon download it, it goes down to your computer. And then when the other person either gets it um, in an email, they would take that file that's saved to their computer and simply import it by finding it, opening it, and then it would import. And I'll show you that as an example as well later too. Another difference between SSDT reports and custom reports is the ability to share. So this was, you had to download it to like email it to somebody. This one you can share with exact, like with another role. For example, if you had a custom report that you wanna share with all the principals in um, the eight different schools, they could share that with the, the role of a principal. And then when the principal logs in, they'll see it on their report manager. So you can share those types of custom reports. SSDT reports can kind of be shared, but again, you have to um, customize them first, resave it as a custom report, and then, then they can be shared. And then the, uh, this column is like your bookmark in Google or whatever browser you use. So we see that um, the AR billing summaries check marked and the budget account. So when I log in and I happen to be on the home page, I could have all my template reports show, including the custom or just my favorites, which I mentioned these two. And there are these canned reports on the report menu. And the level of customization is um, limited on these. And partly is because sometimes like the revenue and expenditure reports, if you think about it like Safari, it's pulling from all different kinds of tables, very complicated. So we just hard coded the complicated canned report. The accounts payable report is like the classic payable report that um, districts often run at the end of the fiscal year for their gap auditors. And you see, and I'm just gonna show you like what the report opens up to be. And you'll see a difference when I go to the template reports. So you see you have options, but it's pretty simple. The account status report 
is like the account status report in Classic. You can enter your fund. You have limited options here to enter the date. This show report options would be like your first page on a PDF. And it would list your options that you picked up here. You do have format options like Excel. We don't have CSV files yet, but um, these are the ones that are available and you would simply submit. Another canned report would be the financial summary by fund. And this was like the fun sum report in classic. And this is very limited. You do have an um, option to sort by function or object. And you have your formats. Your vendor new hire report. And this was like the report in classic. Again, very limited projection or actual, or actually that would be actual. This would be projection. And you would enter your dates. This is a drop down, very simple. And your revenue and expenditure report. I don't know how people said this acronym, but it was F N D R E V E X P on rev expense. So you can see your options are limited, but it does run a nice report. I should have showed you a report. Let me show you an account status report. I won't show you everyone, but since it was simple, it, um, maybe that wasn't a good idea, but that'll pop up. Here we go. So this would be your option page of what I picked. I picked 006, the date range. And then you get this, the report which in the system, you notice it's the current period of February and the report shows that as well. So let's compare these simple setups to like uh, template report. And again, like these grids, you have options to pull in with the more button and you have options to sort. You can do, like if I was gonna do the budget summary, you could type in budget around those percentage marks and get all the ones that contain the word budget. You can see kind of what I do is SSDT in the first letter. That's just by habit and it pops up. Or I could have went to the report menu or the home menu because it was marked as favorite. So I'm going to go into the report and this looks kind of simple, but there's also three different tabs that you can go into to um, filter and sort. So this is what you see when you open up, when you click on this generate and download report. <laughs> and you see these three tabs. This is like it was in classic where you could recall the last, the most recent report that you ran, maybe a customized report, or the default settings. And again, these tabs, I'm going to go through each one of them. We'll start here on the report tab. 
This is where you have the printing format that you can choose. You can choose the PDF. Here you can pick the CSV files. You can do Excel, but just a note, you see that Excel and this Excel with data. This is more like a PDF, pretty, pretty it's, a, it's a picture of the spreadsheet. So you really want, I would think most people would want to use this. This is what you're used to seeing in Excel with the headers on top, the columns in a spreadsheet that you can manipulate, change, update. And then you have view and the other options. You have page size, which you can do letter, legal, half letter, note or ledger. I would think the first two are probably the most common. And orientation, portrait or landscape. And here you can um, change the report name if, you, if the user chooses. So you could put budget summary report cafe. This is if you want summary data on your report, which doesn't work with Excel, but it would work on PDFs. And this, again, would be that first page that I showed you with the report options. And again, that won't show on Excel um, formats, but it will show on like a PDF report. And then you have the generate button. But I'm not going to generate the report quite yet because I'm going to go through these other tabs. And then this little icon, you can schedule a report to send. And I'll again show you that in a little bit. You can actually schedule the report to be sent somewhere. And honestly, I have been in the system for a while and I've heard these trainings and I put on trainings and I still learn something new every day. I've seen these arrows, but I never realized what they did. They actually changed these tabs. So you can click on the tab or you can hit these arrows. And that's just an indication that there is so much to learn in the system, but you'll, it's, it's capable of doing so much. So I'm going to use the new button that I found and go to the next tab. So the query option menu tab, whatever you want to call it, this is where you can filter the information for your report. It's what you'll choose or what the user will choose to be included in the report. Now, these are going to look different, possibly, on different reports. There could be a lot fewer options, but a budget summary, um, just like in classic, you might want to narrow it down to the object, special cost center, OPU. So you have that ability with some tool tips here, like um, include fund, and it says you could use a percentage sign for the wild card. So if you want all your um, federal grant accounts that start with 500, you could do that. Or you could just simply enter a cafeteria fund. You can also enter the whole account and any of these options. Active only um, would pull only active accounts for this account that I chose. So I'm furthering it, filtering down. So I'm going to put just active accounts. The total as of period, this is, um, I guess it's not that new, but I like it. We're in the period, current period of February. But if I wanted to run a report without opening up posting periods or worrying about that, most of these reports have this total as of period. And it has a tool tip. If you leave it blank, it's going to pull in 
information as of the current period, which is February. But if you populate it because you want to pull in January, you can put in any date in January because it's going to pull in the total as of January, um, as of January 21. So you could put January 1st, you could put January 15th. It doesn't matter because it's really looking at the month and the year. So I'll put January 15th. We will talk about filters later, but you can enter a filter name to possibly narrow it down just to like high school funds. But I'll give you an example of that later as well when we create a filter. And then exclude accounts with zero amounts. You leave it blank if you want all accounts. You, if you want to exclude zero amount accounts, you put true. And then those options are set up. And I could generate, but I'm gonna show you the next. Um, the sort options tab. So what you are seeing here are the, the sortable properties that are available on this report. <clears throat> and they're listed on the left here. And you are able to click and drag and customize what um, you can customize it to like determine your sort or subtotals based on the fields that are included in your report. So whatever you set as a default will show on these selected properties. So what you're seeing here, if you hover over, the, you see two full account codes. So you almost have to hover to figure out which one's which. But the first one is cash account. So what's this, this is telling you is the first sort on this report is gonna go by the cash account. The cash accounts like 006 and your special cost center. This is saying you have the ability to sort ascending or descending. Um, you can assort ascending if you have like more than one fund. In this case, I only put 006 in here. And then this control break will give you a total on your report. So every time there's a new cash account, say that I'm running it for all cash accounts, every when it changes from 001 to the next cash account of 006, it'll total and it'll give you a sum. If you want 001 funds on one page and 006 on another, that's where this would come into play. It would page break between the different cash accounts. And then this full account code is sorted by the full account code or the expenditure account. So if we ran this report without this 006, I wanted to give you an example because I do, it, I ran an example, but it was 94 pages long. So, and it took a bit. So just to show you, I just have a sample. So well, I just processed it and you can see that between 002 in 003, there are totals. So that's what this report is creating. If you want to 
further customize it though. Say you want to sort it down by maybe by building. So the first, um, maybe not by building, uh, by object, like, um, salaries, benefits, purchase services. So I would find, there we go, one, like a one digit level to click and drag. And you see the blue line, it indicates where you wanna click and drag. Um, you do wanna know where you're gonna drop it because once you do, oops, I can't like move it up in this grid. I can only move it back and then, oops. And then redo it. So I put it in between. So what this is gonna do is first sort on the cash account and then further sort on the one digit object code. And I'm gonna do it in ascending order. And I do want a control break. So I can get a total for um, the 100s, the 200s, the 400s. And I have a choice to page break if I want. So if I run the report now with these query parameters and those sort options, Here's my total pay or my, what do you call it? Your page summary page. As of period, I chose January, 2021. Here's my fund that I said. And then here is where it sorted by 006 and then it started breaking it down to the one digit object. So all 100s total here, all 200s start and then it goes it totals and then it goes to the next object so it's very customizable it's, it's cool um and i should have showed you that at the bottom it does give you Um, a grand total of all those um, objects above. So this is the last object and then, then the grand totals. So I am gonna open up this report again. And again, I could either do the most recent and you see how it saved my setup and my options. Or if I wanted to clear it out, I would go back to the default. Now the most recent is based, it's per user. So what my most recent report is not going to be what's saved under your most recent report. You can also make it your own. And you would do this by clicking this blank line and start naming it whatever you want. And then once you name or enter something in there, this little icon pops up, which allows you to save your format. So then the next time you come in, it's saved under here. Now you can also delete. Like I obviously started one for Pat and only put a P in there. So let's delete that. Are you sure? Yes. And now it's no longer there. Um, 
go back to the cafe. Once you have a custom, once you name it and have that, this little link pops up, which if I click it, you can um, you can send like this link into an email to someone else. And then you can check mark, include parameters if you want or not. But I would be um, mindful of sensitive information that might be emailed to another user. But that link is possible um, to include like in an email. So this little button down here, it looks like a clock. I kind of mentioned it before. This is how you would schedule a report. I'm gonna click on it. It's like if I wanna send the cash summary to the cafeteria every Monday morning, for instance. So once I clicked on that clock button, I have the ability to change the job name if I wanted to. Let's put high school cafeteria. The cron expression, um, is we have a, in the wiki, we go to appendix, we have this tab report procedures which can be very handy. And I'll be referring to this um, a lot today, but here's a link for scheduling a report to run a cron job. And then we have two free online cron expression generators. So you basically have to generate this cron expression and it looks like this. Um, but again, it's if you send it on a Monday morning, it's going to be a different cron expression than a, every Friday afternoon. That's why you have to create it. So, and it's really easy. I tend to use the first one. So I'll click on that. Here you have the ability to narrow it down to the year, 2021, wherever you are, the month. So you could send it every, every January, so forth. However, oh, and then as you're narrowing it down, the result is down here that you would copy by right clicking and bringing it into the redesign to populate that field. But below, there are examples. So like I said, if I wanted to send this report every Friday at noon, I would simply oops, copy this, go back to my instance, right click and paste it in there. And so now every Friday at noon, this cafeteria report for the high school is gonna be sent. Sent where? I'm gonna send it to myself in my email. So I would just enter my email and click save. And um, your, your report is scheduled to send. It's kind of cool. Um, and where you would, I should have scheduled that. Let me go back in there so that we could see. So it's scheduled. And so where do you see this? Is it done? Is it started? And I'm going to be going over this later and under the utilities. But since we're talking about it now, it's under the job scheduler. What we did was we created a job to send a report somewhere. So 
So that's where it would be found here. And you can see that, again, remember you can customize these to, um, to your liking. You can see that I have two jobs pending. Once they are complete, it'll update to complete. You can click on like the row. This is the one that I, we just ran. And it gives you a little bit more information. It does say the next run is tomorrow. Because tomorrow is Friday, yay. And then this one, I don't remember what I scheduled, but it's set for tomorrow. And again, if you want more details to come into your grid, you have that option. So it even can tell you the last run was run at um, 3.15 and so forth. I apologize, I haven't given you guys a chance to ask questions. I have been watching the chat, but I'll pause for a minute and see if you guys have any questions. I get a drink of coffee. So we've looked at the canned reports, yesterday the periodic reports, the template reports, and now let's look at the report menu of custom report creator. This is a blank slate. <laughs> to me, it would be kind of like intimidating to start here until I really get used to it. And it's probably gonna be like that for most of your users, but it is, I'll show you how to start it with a template report in a minute. But basically, if you were gonna start from a blank slate like that, your object here, which I'll point out in the template report again, should be picked, say I want, the cash account for a cash sum. And then once I pick the object, this should look familiar. And your three tabs should look familiar. And then you start just clicking and dragging and creating what we saw earlier. That's more in depth. And again, that can be, um, that we do have some Fridays with fiscals that go more in depth with that but I am going to show you how to customize a, a template. I'm gonna start with the cash summary. We looked at that icon, but to customize it, I'm gonna, you see how the tooltip says open report definition and detail report view. And that's what I'm gonna click on. And this is what we saw under the, um, the custom, but it's already chosen your object and your select properties and gives you a good start. So if I click on here, you see these three tabs that we talked about a little while ago. You know how we drag and put it in between the two. So this is all gonna to come together, but we're gonna start with the object, which is the cache, and look at the select properties. You can um, think of these objects as like those, they're, they were similar to Safari tables, if any of you guys used Safari. I personally like this better than Safari. But once you pick your object, then you can determine your properties here. 
So the select properties is what I want to see on my report. You can click and drag. And here you actually can move your columns. You can delete it off. You can reorder. And actually, I'm going to delete the encumbrance. Uh, the unencumbered balance. So this is going to be the cash summary is like the thin sum. I can all along save my report up here as a new name. So let's just say in the sum, even though we're trying to get away from those acronyms and click save. You can do this in the end too. I'm just in the habit of doing it because I've lost too many in the past. So let's customize it and bring in a property. Let's see. We will customize it so it shows only accounts that had like a month to date, month, yeah, month to date amount received, which I see here. We already have that um, selected property. So let's bring in we'll bring in the fiscal year to date receivable and put it under the expended. And we'll put all the fiscal year to dates together by clicking and dragging. So then I got the month to dates together and the fiscal year to dates together. You can do whatever you want to customize it. So then going across your sort priority, it, it determines um, your default order on your sort. So again, this is the cash account. We're, and we're sorting it um, by that. So we're, and I'm, you can change the sort. You can add more sorts down, you know, to other properties. I'm just gonna leave it as one so it sorts on the cash. Your sort order can be chosen. You can check control break if you want. But since this is just, I'm running this for like one fund, I'm not gonna, um, require that. The function, you know, how we added the receivable, which is um, numbers, basically. So do you want a total? It does have the ability to sum up those totals by adding the function. You do have other options like average, minimum, or maximum. And then These three little dots are for the advanced training, but I am gonna go through them just so you get, so you see them and get more familiar with them. So this is basically called extended properties. Some of these, once I open this up, you'll see some of these are under this menu. So those experienced users could just go here and start setting all the um, property settings, whatever you want to call them, filters. If you do plan on using these, I would definitely go to the wiki to review or there, like I mentioned, there was a fiscal with Friday review in January of 2020. And it talked about the dynamic sort options. That might be a good training or, um, or a good one to review because we recorded it. But just to give you a brief, brief description, this display name would be the top of the column. It's not, this field is not custom. You can't change this. If you click on suppressed, it would exclude, 
it would leave it in the, if you click it, it would leave it in the sort priorities to sort in your report, but it won't show on your report. So you could have a control break, but not show it on your, you know, as its own column, for instance. The sort priority, again, was similar to this. And same with sort order, ascending or descending. And that's what I said, you could just come to this extended properties as you get more familiar to it and set some of these. Suppress, let me start over, suppress repeating. If you have a value in one of your columns that is the same for every record, um, and if you check this, it will repeat on every record. It'll just show it once. So the tooltip says if the same value appears on consecutive detail lines, it suppresses the repeating value. Control break, page break, and the function were all similar to this and works the same way. I said that you couldn't change the name up here because it's grayed out, but you can customize your column um, down here. So uh, fiscal year to date, to be received instead of receivable, receivable, for instance. So that would be your new column title on top. Oh, I kind of skipped this, the alignment. This would be the alignment in your column. Sometimes on reports, if you have like a huge number, uh, well, maybe not the number, but you could align it like center, you can align it right justified, left justified. That's really getting into customizing and, um, but it can be done. Control footer and control header and detail header. These are used, um, these allow you to add information to like the control break or the header. So, Um, if you checked the control header, I believe it puts it like right next to the header here. Whereas if you check the control, what was it called? Control footer, it would be next to the total, the total line. So that's just some of the variations that you can like customize your report. But again, that's more advanced and you can check out the wiki or the Fridays with Fiscals um, before playing with that. The width, this is where like if you have a huge number, you might and the either the description or the numbers wrap into the next line, you have the ability to customize the width of the column, which that's kind of nice. All right, so we went through selected properties. If I click on the next tab, configure filters. This is used to narrow down information to show. So you can set these up so that you can select items to filter on. For example, like the cash account um, for 006. This filter value looks different, but I'm trying to think how I can explain this. You can either hard code it into the report or place, create this filter value to include it on the user's option page. So for example, you see here it says active only or total as of period. Let me go back 
to generate the report. You see how you have the active only or total as of? That is what this language filter value is doing. It's creating that so that when the user goes to choose, they can just simply put in their amount. So, but we're gonna, um, I'm gonna show you how to hard code one so that if I run this report, I am gonna always get the cafeteria fund 006. Uh, let's see. I am going to pull in I think I'm going to do month to date received, drag and drop. There's a lot of operation things that you can choose here. And for a description, I actually am going to show you in the wiki. Under reports, and we're customizing, so I'm going to go under custom report, configure filters. And it shows you what we were seeing. But down below, it gives you each one of these operations with the definition and how you would choose it. So like, if you use the operation of like, you can use that wild card of one parentheses, or not parentheses, I did that the other day, one percentage sign, percentage sign. You can put words that, you know, under contains between you can um, do between two numbers with a comma and so forth, greater than, greater than or equal. And then that little language that um, lets the user choose the param perimeter value, that can be found here. And it even gives you what it would look like when it's created and some examples. So it's in the wiki. Once we get more advanced and more used to the reports, that can be accessed easily. And again, it was under the reports. I also want to show you some another. Under the appendix, there's a report procedure, which also talks about customizing a template report and totally walks you through what I am. And again, a cron job, we're gonna be going over the report bundle and so forth. Okay, so month to date received. If I wanna pull in something that was that had an amount or I, I only want to pull in accounts that had uh, monies received in the month. I'm going to pick um, greater than zero. So once I save this and run it, it's not going to show on the page where I showed you the user had that choice because I'm hard coding it here. I'm not putting this parameter in there. I'm hard coding it to zero, if that makes sense. And please ask me questions if you have any. Let's see, make sure I cover everything. I can save the report again, just to make sure I save what I created. If I go to generate report, again, this is where you see the Ones where like we started with, I am gonna do the report options. I can change the name. Put 06. And generate. 
There's my options page. And you can see that, excuse me, the new column that I just added appears here, month to date received, and it was 4006. Any questions on that? All right, so I think that's what I wanted to hit on, on reports. But there was a couple other icons on this report manager grid that I wanted to review. And then before going to utilities, then we'll take a break. But this is, um, remember I said somebody could share a report from you or with you, or you can, um, on Monday, I talked about going to this public USAS reports library. And it is based on accounts, budgeting, transaction. So let's say I want a PO detail by date. Is this what I want? Yeah, that's what I want. So I would download that to my computer, go back to my instance under report manager, Click on report, find that it's a JSON file, find the one that I just downloaded, click on it. It gives you a chance to re, uh, name it whatever you want, you know, detail by date, customized. You can um, add a description and you can even um, add a tag like, Say I do uh, PO processing and I have a certain number of reports or whatever. You can name whatever your tag is. Like these are. So once you hit save, there's my report. And again, you have all the abilities to do things unlike a typical SSDT report because you customized it. And then you just run it. So that can be handy. So especially when you have friends at other ITCs or districts that are creating reports, um, send them chocolate and they'll share their reports or go to the public shared library and get a report there. The other button is create form, and I like this. Um, you can create and customize forms like if you wanted to put a logo on your purchase order or maybe a disbursement check or I don't know. The example I'm going to show you is putting a logo on a purchase order form. So first I'm going to go to The appendix. Under useful procedures, there is creating custom forms for printing PDF transactions. It kind of walks you through, but it has a template here and a click here for technical documentation. But I actually just started with this. I, I wanted to customize my purchase order. So I download it. I click in here, which I already have it downloaded. So let me grab it. Well, Okay, 
So you would basically take this and edit this file. So here is my generic logo name that I basically placed on my purchase order with all this language that I got from the wiki, saved it. And then in my instance, all I would do is create form, give it a report name, a description, a possible tag, and the entity type would be a purchase order. Right here. And then I would select my form wherever I saved it, click save, and then it's on my grid. So, and I, my description that I entered was um, PO form with logo. So let me show you how that can be used. It's gonna be stored here on the report manager because you created it here. But when the user goes to use or to print a purchase order, and click print, Remember, you have the option of an XML file or a PDF. Once you click a PDF, your form options pop up. You can either go with the default form or the new created form with logo. And so when you print it, the logo is there. And again, you, you can create your Word file that you uploaded to create form and place that anywhere you want, but I placed it up here and it looks pretty. Uh, let's see. Let me go through the report bundles and then we'll take a break. So <clears throat> report bundles are used to, or the report bundle function in here is used to generate a bundle of reports, such as like the SST monthly reports. So it's kind of similar to the, like that monthly CD. If you look at the options, you can see that we have one custom bundle, and then the rest are SSDT bundles with different options here. Um, SSTT bundles, like the monthly report bundle, you can only view You can't do anything on here but view. And you can enable or disable. And if you recall, when you're Closing a posting period, say we're closing the month of January. Every time the posting period is closed, the monthly SSDT report bundle will be run. So when you have multiple closures of posting periods, sometimes the user may want to opt to disable the report bundle um, because they only opened up the month for a specific issue and it's not gonna change any totals on the report. So you could disable it by unchecking it if you want to. However, on the custom report bundles, you have more options. And you can create these custom bundles, for example, creating one like the cash summary and the budget summary to be sent every month the beginning of the month to the high school. So you could get a report bundle for like 018 principal um, funds and the 300 athletic funds and get it uh, in a bundle and in a job. 
So the first icon we have is the clock. So again, you can schedule the report bundle. And you notice SST, SSDT, you can't schedule because they're already scheduled based on closing a posting period. So when I clicked on the custom report bundle clock, this is what comes up. It can be scheduled in three different ways. A cron job is a reoccurring job ran like on a regular interval. And you notice as I change some of these, well, this, this is your cron expression. When I change to event, then you're gonna have event populate here, or you can send it immediate like to yourself, an email or an FTP URL. So immediate is like run on, running on demand. The cron expression is the same wiki page that we looked at before. I don't think I have it. Oh yeah, there we go. The next icon would be the view. Here, you can name your bundle and add a description or a tag. However, once you schedule this bundle, you can't change the name of the report bundle. Um, I'm gonna create one in a minute, but I'm gonna talk about these icons first. So, I guess I talked about edit. You can delete a custom bundle. You cannot delete an SSDT bundle. And again, you can enable or disable the report bundle. So report bundles can by they can be sent by email. Um, and if they're sent by email, the users do um, would not have to be logged into the USAS or USPS to get that. However, again, be mindful of sensitive information being emailed. Um, and you can also send reports to like the file archive. There is a full training on report bundles, um, I believe in December, and how to schedule them in last August, August 2020, if you wanna to refer to those. But I'm gonna create a bundle I simply by click and create. I'm going to put high school additional reports. Oops. I can put um, a description monthly for 018 and 300 funds. I'll just do the 018. And if I wanted a monthly peg, I could do that. Here is where you either start typing, like SSD budget summary. You can do the drop down. Sorry, let me get this out of the way. So the budget summary, and you see I have many populate here. Once I put in the budget summary, it brought up my default, the one I saved under Pat, most recent run, and the bud sum for a cafe. So choose the one that you want, and I guess I should have put 006 up here, because that's the report I'm gonna pick. So add it to the, down here is where you're reports are currently in the bundle. So right now we have nothing in the bundle, but I want this bud sum budget summary to be in the bundle. Um, there are also some canned reports that are available now too to add to this bundle. 
So one that I can see that would um, be nice to add would be your SSDT cash reconciliation. So your monthly bank reconciliation, that would be nice to have in the, maybe not in the high school additional reports, but I'm just saying in a, an additional monthly bundle that you create, a treasurer might want that to be included. And there's other um, canned reports like a financial summary by fund or the revenue and expenditures report that can also be added to a bundle. So then I would just move this up. Okay, I'm just gonna click save, I can't. I want to see if there was anything at the bottom there. Um, and then you scheduled it. It's the wrong report. So then you would either do it immediate event or cron. So if I did it every Friday at noon, set it to me. But one thing I did wanna mention down here, a multiple notifications with a single attachment or a single notification, like one email with multiple attachments. Like if I had four reports, it would be one email with all those attachments. So I know that's a lot. Um, reports can do a lot in the system. And that's what makes it nice. There are tips in the appendix, tips under the report uh, menu, and then we're always here to help too. So let's take a 10 minute break. Um, I have like 10, 12, we can uh, come back here at about 10.22. I'm gonna pause this and stretch your legs and we'll come back and talk about the utilities menu. Pat, you're still muted. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> I, I forgot to show you something on the report bundle, so I will um, retract a little bit. We recreated this high school additional monthly reports. I'm gonna go in there and edit. And you can see um, that down here, you have some icons that you can utilize. And since this is going to the high school um, every Friday monthly, I probably don't want the cash reconciliation uh, in the report bundle, so I can delete it. And then this little pencil icon, I can still edit. This should look familiar. So just to check my parameters, 006. Um, I had this date in there earlier. 
But if I'm going to send this every Friday at noon, then I probably want to leave this blank because when it's blank, it'll pull it as of the current period, which is February in this case. And then you'll be able to save your bundle and then it's set up correctly. So I just wanted to show you that even though it's um, in the report bundle, you can you can edit it before um, with those little icons. Apologize for being muted earlier. It is recording. Okay. So let's go to the you. If do you, does anybody have any questions? If not, I will go to the utilities menu. And the utility menu contains like the account functions. You see the first one is the account filters. And this was like um, in classic, the USA security screen, maybe the second screen. Um, these will get, let me go there. These will get imported and it controls what a user can create, what a user can read, update, delete, or process. This is a demo, so they're not all technically right named. So we're gonna create one. I just simply created or clicked on create. I'm gonna call the filter name high school secretary. I gotta find my page where I was at in my notes, sorry. Okay. So my, my filter is gonna be called high school secretary. To add, I would add, hit this plus sign. And this sort of looks like classic with the accounts that you're specifying. And then these tool tips, the C is for create. R is for read, update, delete, pre-encumbrance, so they'd be able to enter requisitions, and encumbrance, they'd be able to <clears throat> process purchase orders. And you guys are familiar with the transaction indicator. I'm gonna want this high school secretary to see budget accounts for their building. So budget is O2 transaction indicator. Even though I want the high school secretary to see their accounts, I don't want them to see salaries or benefits. So this is where you would filter them out by filtering out by object and again, we'll use the percentage sign as a wild card. So all 100 accounts um, is what that's saying. And then I can set the access over here, but since I don't want the secretary to see the 100 object accounts, I'm gonna leave it blank. I'm gonna do the same thing with the 200 object accounts because those are the benefits. And I'm gonna leave it blank because I don't want them to see that either. I do, however, want them to see every, um, I want them to be able to read and process requisitions for their building. And if you recall, the operational unit is defined by the building or by the district. <clears throat> and it helps narrow down, down the counts. So in this case, the OPU is, uh, for that building is 001 in my example. I am gonna allow this high school secretary to read 
and process requisitions. So I would choose the pre-encumbrance because that's what a requisition is. And then I would save it. And then I'm going to show you uh, Oh, I got an error. Sometimes, and I'm gonna just talk about this for a moment. Sometimes we ask you to expand the error, error and that's this little drop down. Sometimes that can give the support team more information. But what I'm seeing here is I forgot the transaction indicator. So I'll resave. <clears throat> And then I'm going to show you how to use this account filter like in a purchase order detail report. So that's going to give me all the purchase orders. Um, so this is what the filter looks like. And by running the purchase order report, I'm going to get a purchase order report that excludes salary and benefits accounts and for their building only. <clears throat> Show options. So here is the, um, where you would enter the filter name and I called it high school secretary. And I entered it like that. But if I, you got to remember that these are the account filters are case sensitive. So if I happen to not capitalize the S, it will not work because I saved it under the account filter menu option as that. So then when I generate the report, I will only see purchase orders or 400s and 500 accounts with the uh, OPU of 100 in the accounts. So account filters can be handy as well. Account change. This is a replacement for like classics account change. It allows you to change the expenditure and revenue account codes while leaving the original account still on the system. They'll still be in the redesign system, which is different than classic, but they'll be in, indicated as an inactive status. Um, in classic, the account just kind of went away, I think. So you have the ability to merge accounts here too. And first, I'm going to show you, explain what we're seeing here. Here you see this um, account change from going from this account, a supply account with the OPU of 101-01 uh, and we're moving it to 02. But if the status says it failed. And over here, it tells you why. And it's because an account change will only change and update the current fiscal year transaction. So it's basically telling you that this account change failed because it was in the previous fiscal year. And this one completed successfully. And you don't have any other options to pull in with the more button. They're all displayed here. So let's create one. Oh, and then you can, if you don't have an expenditure account set up, you can go ahead and add it here. That looks similar to adding it um, under the core menu. Same with the revenue. And the drop down for the fiscal year. So let's create one. 
for the fiscal year 2021. Um, there's a lot of areas in the system where you could pull in a revenue account or an expenditure account, and this is one of them. And if you just start going like down the drop down, it's going to start um, like with the budget. So here's a trick. If you are doing um, an account change for a budget account, if you enter the transaction indicator with a slash, so O2 slash, it'll start with the expenditure accounts. If you were doing an account change for revenue, you would do the transaction indicator of O3 slash, and then you see that the revenue accounts start coming up. So that's uh, a nice tip that you can use. I can't think of other places in the system, but I know I've used it in other places because I haven't processed an account change myself. But I have used that tool tip other places. So O2 is the budget accounts, O3 is the revenue accounts. So let's again, create one. I know my account, so I'm gonna change it to, and as you see, as I start typing, it's the system is bringing up and narrowing down, and then I can choose. The same one that I did, no. So, I am basically changing the this account for meeting expense to this account. So once I have my accounts in there and I click save and go back to the grid, you see that it's indicated as new. You would check that apply the account change and it indicates that it started. Eventually this will update with the refresh button and be complete or failed. Let's pretend that we fix this account <clears throat> and we go to hit excuse me, another one, you will get an error saying that there's a job currently in process. So that's a relatively new feature because what was happening was one account change was messing with the other account change. So now you're limited to one account change at a time until that one's complete. You can, however, pick multiple ones and, and apply them all at once you can't do like you can't apply like my like what we did we applied one and that's in process and then I went to apply another one the system wouldn't let me and the, the error message will tell you that you do have the same restrictions as it's got to be the same fund account change Um, say you needed a new account entered, you would click create, you would enter this information. Um, and then it would be available to use. Any questions on that? The next option under the utility menu is the automatic reconciliation. This is a, this is a one time setup and it's, it's to set up the format of the bank file that is used to pull in the information that automatically marks your disbursements reconciled. And it's all dependent upon the bank's requirements, but you would just, um, this would be a delete or, okay. 
I'll show you an example of the National Bank of ST, SSDT. And all I did was create by clicking this button. This is a drop down. You see some of it like the bank account up here. It sets the format but can be changed. And then once that's set up, I already saved it. And that's why it was under here. But if I wanted to save it to, what's the load? Then when I come in here, I could pick which one. But this allows you on the disbursement menu to have that auto reconcile button. The change password is you would the user, this gives the the user the ability to change their password as long as they know their old password. So you would put the old one here, the new one here, and then verify the new one and change password. You can also um, change it here before they log in. It's the same option. Um, Active Directory, I think there was a JIRA issue that requested the ability for Active Directory users to be able to use this, but currently it's not available. File Archive. This is, um, you'll find, this is where you find your re monthly report bundle, the SSDT hit had scheduled under the report bundle menu, your fiscal year report bundle and your calendar year report bundle. And then once the historical files are imported from classic, like using the monthly CD or fiscal CD and the next option we're gonna talk about file import, then they would be populated here. But when you close the month, the bundle gets created you have um, the ability to edit the description, view the description, edit, and delete. If you click on the row, it will show you all January 21 um, reports, which then you can see the timestamp of when January was closed, which was March 14th. You can download and look at the purchase order report that was run for January. And you see that this was under the January report and it automatically is programmed just to pull in January. And you have the ability, just like any other grid, to customize it, sort. This is a demo, so I don't have a prior fiscal year. And I, oh, I do have calendar year. Okay. So if I, again, if I click on the um, line, it'll give you the calendar year and reports that I can access. And then, like I said, to get the monthly CD out of reflection and z by zipping those files, then you would come to file import and uh, upload your zip file, find it, and then import the zip file. So 
that's kind of handy. Mass load. Um, this is like the USA load account load option in Classic. <clears throat> but right now, <clears throat> it is limited to the cash expenditure and revenue accounts. But it does allow the district to import cash expenditure and revenue data into the USASR instance from an outside source. So it could be from a third party software, it could be Excel, and then the specs are in the wiki. Let's just go to the utilities, mass load. If you're doing a cash account, then the specs are here, expenditure account. So everything's laid out for you in regards to that. And then this is useful to inactivate budgets by using the account code dimensions and status field and then mass inactivating the accounts. We talked a little bit about the job scheduler. Um, I'm gonna move my status tab over so it can be next to the job. Um, we have these two budget report cafes scheduled for, I believe, Friday at noon. So those are still pending. This high school additional monthly report, I actually set it to send immediately to myself an email and it failed. So sometimes by opening this up, um, you can tell why it failed. Looks like I had something empty because it gave me a null error, but it's a good example to show because it'll either <clears throat> give you complete or pending. Uh, let's see. If you need to delete a job like the one that failed, I would just simply click the X. Are you sure you wanna delete? Yes. The next item is a proration utility. Now this generates a spreadsheet like in Excel, which can be used in assisting in calculating like um, the workers comp premium compensation payments. They, they get, um, they give you an amount billed and then often districts and treasurers wanna take that, we'll just say $10,000 workers comp bill and break it down to the salary accounts or the benefits accounts based on the salaries. So you would have a workers, account, workers comp amount set aside for all the administrators where they prorate it to um, the cafeteria workers. However, their account structure is set up. That's what, how it's gonna prorate. So that can be handy. Um, but first you need to create an account filter to work with the workers' comp amounts. So we're gonna go back to the account filter. I don't think I have one set up, so we, I do, okay. So I'll just open it and, be, and show you. So the account filter was set up to be based on um, 100 object salaries. And then when I go into the proration utility, I can find my filter. Oh, sorry, that's the count filter. 
So you can use a, yeah, that's what I want. And then click create, it'll open up the spreadsheet. Something's not working here. Okay, here's a good example. So I use the a different account filter. And I'll I'll go to that account filter in a minute. So this is what it comes up to. And you get an amount, like I said, 10,000, which is probably too high, but just, this is just a demo. So 10,000, I would enter in B, B1 column. And once I click off of it, you see how the, the worksheet populates the amount. So now the, um, this account's distributed $37 for of the workers' comp premium. <laughs> this is the wrong filter because it's filtering to purchase services and supplies, but it would work the same if you had the filter set up correctly. And, and basically that's what it is. You enter your the premium in B1 and it prorates in this, and then you can take these prorated amounts and apply them when you're um, invoicing that workers' comp purchase order. Any questions on that? PO refresh. This isn't used a lot, but sometimes the support staff here at SSDT will um, advise the ITC to do this. It does require only admin access. And it's, it's used because um, a user canceled a purchase order that was zero. So the status like behind the scenes needs to be updated. And users don't have this access to use, but when um, SSTT might advise the ITC to do this PO refresh, that's where you would come and you would just simply put in your purchase order number and hit refresh. And then your purchase order often becomes um, from invoiceable with a zero amount to un not invoiceable, for instance. It updates the status. And then show profile. This was like under the USAS Web's utility show profile. It gives the details about the user's account. Um, I'm logged in as an administrator with a description. Are there any questions? See, there was a recent chat message. If there's no questions, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Amanda. She has some miscellaneous uh, items to go over. And before I do that, is there anything that I forgot to cover, Amanda? Or if you had anything to add, feel free, but the floor is yours. No, I think you got it. I think you got it all covered. So, oh. okay. 
So let me see. Is it, it's sharing the one with the wiki, right? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Usually it shows me like a green line or something. Um, okay, so we're just going to wrap up with um, kind of a couple uh, just miscellaneous. We're gonna talk about where you can find some information. Um, the last thing in the system though that we're gonna cover is um, for districts that are using EIS, uh, right now, even when they go over to redesign, they're still going to be using the EIS module from Classic, um, but that won't be for too much longer because the redesign EIS module is um, in progress right now, and uh, we expect that to come out over the summer. So uh, this process will be for um, the current time period, but maybe, well, uh, so next year when we do a beginner training, we probably won't be covering this part. <laughs> um, okay, so basically they're going to be keeping all of their um, inventory transactions still in Classic, but one of the things that they can do and may have done in Classic is they would have a pending file where recent invoices that were processed in USAS will create sort of um, a file that they can pull some of the information from to then be able to create their inventory items. And that just makes it a bit easier. So once they have the um, once they have all of their invoices in in redesign, then how do they get that back to classic and there is a process for that um, we're going to i'm in the USAS R uh, documentation. And it is in useful procedures here. And then creating an inventory extract and importing it to classic. So this is your walkthrough. This is where all the important notes are. Um, and the first thing that we're seeing here is this big note that says under system um, and modules, you need to have the module installed. And then there's also a configuration. So I'm just going to look at those things pretty quickly here. So system modules, we were in here yesterday. Um, and one of these items right here is the EIS classic integration. Uh, this it's already turned on in my test database. I can see it's installed, but um, if you know, you have a district, you might want to double check this. I believe when they migrate, if they have the um, certain settings configured in classic, it, it will come in installed, but um, you, you still wanna, I would still advise to just double check and make sure, and if not, all you have to do is click on the plus and that will install the module. Uh, the next place we're going is to the configuration, another um, part we touched on yesterday. We're going to open up this EIS classic integration configuration and we get a nice little window here. Um, these options um, again do come over from classic when they migrate as far as what their threshold is and if they have the automatic option checked. Um, what's going to happen and what what redesign is going to do is when they invoice there is a little flag that gets checked to know which one of these transactions needs to pull onto this extract file that we're going to create. Um, these things set the parameters for which line items are checked when they're invoicing. So um, for this one, it's items that are um, over $5,000. And then the automatic checkbox dictates if, um, if it's charged to uh, object code that's uh, in the 500s. If that is checked, then any 500s will automatically be checked. Um, and if it's unchecked, then um, the user would get like a prompt for 500 and 600 object codes that meet this threshold. Um, so let's see. So if we go to our purchase orders and we should be able to just, um, pick one of these to invoice. I'm not gonna actually go through, but I will be able to like at least see the flag. I want you to see where that is. Um, here we go. So 
on each line item you can see in this very last column there's a little uh, checkbox for EIS. So this is where uh, my, my code on this one doesn't happen to qualify. Uh, but if I did still want to check one of these and make it an inventory item, then um, I would be able to check this box. And then I would just process the rest of my invoice like normal. Um, but when I go to pull this report, and maybe that's going to be, you know, monthly or quarterly that they're going to want to move those uh, pending transactions over, anything that's checked will be included. Okay, let's go back here. So um, the inventory pending extract report, it is a template report. So we'll go to our report manager. And um, we can pull it up here. So when we go to generate it, it's going to take its time here this morning. Uh, let's see. So we're generating the report now. Okay, so we have, you know, our options page. Um, it is going to pull into a CSV file because that's what we're going to import into Classic. So um, I would just leave it, you know, defaulted there. And uh, you can enter in a since date. So if they are pulling this, you know, like each month, then they might want to put the first of the month in there and it'll pull um, any invoices that qualify since the date that they've entered. And they shouldn't have to do anything with sort options or anything like that. Um, once they generate this, they would just save it to their computer. And um, then you would transfer it into reflection. And when you come in here, um, I'm just going to show you the screenshot here. We won't actually go into classic since we've done a whole lot already today in this week. <laughs> um, so uh, at the menu prompt, they would just be able to type in EIS IMPR. And that's a special program that was added to be able to handle this file um, and import this into Classic. Um, so once they come in, uh, basically just this, this second section here, processing options in the import file, they would type in the name of their CSV uh, that they've created from um, the redesign and transferred in and then they would go ahead and execute this and that'll bring um, those transactions so that they can use them for their inventory. There is a report you can run here to confirm um, the items on file and then um, they would just proceed. Um, I will warn you, there was a point in time, I think it was like the end of last fiscal year, where there were, um, if they processed their invoices a specific way, um, then some of the items weren't getting marked. So I would say, you know, um, to be cautious of that. Mostly, if it happens, it would be like, uh, people have already noticed by now usually, <laughs> so it's only if someone's really behind on, on their processing. Um, but if you ever run into any discrepancies, whether it's something like that or even in the future, even if maybe they didn't have their threshold how they wanted and so things didn't automatically get checked, um, whatever the reason, um, if you put in a ticket to us, we have a special report that you can use that will just kind of like, um, you'll be able to narrow it down by objects instead of having to use those check boxes. So this report is like the quick and easiest they have to put in as minimal information um, but we have other options too if you ever run into anything odd um, okay so all right do we have any questions about the inventory step All right.
right. Well, then the rest of what I want to talk about today, uh, I know that uh, both Pat and I have been in and out of this wiki the entire training session, but I just wanted to kind of wrap it up by uh, taking a minute to just kind of look through all of what's available in here. Um, well, not all of it, because there's a lot, but um, highlight some things that are important that you might be able to use if you are looking for information. Um, so first of all, the USSR documentation, you know, this is the one that we've really uh, been in. Um, I think, you know, we've seen throughout the week so far that this section, especially corresponding to the different menu options that you have um, in the system can be very useful. Um, I think though, as you are training your districts on redesign too, this is also an excellent resource for them. Uh, so keep that in mind as you go. The appendix, I know um, <laughs> I'm in the appendix probably daily. All of these things are very helpful. And we've worked really hard over the last couple of years to really make sure that um, we have more work, more walkthroughs in here. And um, we have some additional sections that I'll talk about um, that Pat and I have both worked on to uh, make sure that there's really um, some good information in there for you. So um, the first section, we do have these checklists these are going to be your standard checklist for month end, uh, fiscal year end, and calendar year end. Uh, we update those. Uh, you know, we look through, update anything needed. You know, every single um, fiscal year end and calendar year end. Those are linked to our materials when uh, we do those presentations. The general procedures. So these ones are kind of. Um, just like standard step-by-steps. So a lot of these things like disbursements, um, distributions, these are things that have their own um, you know, pages, but this is more of like their processing. So things like receipt and refund processing, transfers and advances. Um, so that's, that's the section where we kind of contain all of that stuff. The migration procedures. So this is, you know, when you're first bringing a district over, you're migrate, migrating them. We have pages for the pre-data and um, post-import uh, steps. So those are very important. This post-import procedures, um, especially is one that, um, you know, is very huge. We have this entire list. Uh, we've talked about modules this week. So here's your list. I think I had mentioned of the different things that you want to check when they come in to redesign. Uh, here's your configuration. And then some of those things on the core menu, periodic menu um, that we've talked about and mentioned that, you know, they would set up um, or look at when they come over. So it's all in one place here for you, I think, is what um, really makes this handy. And then we have the, um, you know, some other like balancing steps here. If you are um, looking for more information on those specific migration steps, we have a training that we did, um, I think last year at some point um, that went fully into detail about the migration steps for both USPS and USAS. Um, and that recording is still um, out there and relevant. So I would refer back to that one. Um, and I am gonna show you, of course, where to find all of our recordings. <laughs> Um, even though we've kind of already talked about some of that, but we're going straight to the YouTube later. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, report procedures. Uh, here are just some different um, walkthroughs related to reports. So um, like Pat was showing um, scheduling with a cron job. So, you know, she was on this page, but um, all of these walkthroughs, we do our best to give you, you know, any links that you'll need, um, you know, really walk you through the process. So, um, let's see. And then useful procedures are kind of, this is kind of like our miscellaneous um, section. So this is where the inventory extract was, customizing those forms um, and the budgeting scenario steps that we talked about. And then we have the FAQ. So the FAQ is newer, something we've been um, adding and we continue to add things as we um, have things that come up more regularly. So uh, within here, it's organized by different categories. 
Um, but even if this is just something that you want to look through, it's um, based off of uh, different situations that we've seen, but we actually did go through the tickets that we get and use that to help formulate the different things that we're going to put in here um, for our frequently asked questions so that that can help you guys out. And then the last one in this appendix is the USSR error messages. So another newer one that we've added um, and we are definitely continuing to add to um, but Pat had just showed earlier when we were looking at the account filters, um, how you can expand that error message if you get one of those errors that pop up. And so we have a little example of this here, you know, and um, certainly if you send that to us, if you have a question on an error, that really helps. Um, sometimes you can, you know, see a bit more yourself when you open those up. Um, but the other thing that you can do with this page is that we've taken uh, these error messages and given you know a bit of information so that if you run into one um, you could come in here and see if maybe this can point you in the right direction so um, and this is also something where you can do a control f so all right so i'm going to say you know maybe my error says something about a duplicate so, oh, and it is a purchase order. And then this would kind of just give me some more information and let me know maybe what I should look at. So this can be very helpful. Okay. All right, so the next place we're going, let's go back to the main page here is another page that'll look familiar to what we've looked at this week, the SSDT meetings and trainings. Um, we talked about, you know, the um, beginner training information is here, but also we have sections for the intermediate training, miscellaneous training items. Um, and then we have our year end information that you would find from here as well. The ITC training and registration uh, page is the grid that we have um, where we have all of our trainings planned out. This is where you would have registered. Um, and as you scroll down here, we have a couple of USAS trainings that we're just ironing out the topics for, but I think we plan to get those out there pretty soon. Um, I know we've tossed around some ideas, um, but once we actually hold the training, um, we do come in here and post the recording. So we already have the recordings out here for um, the two days this week, and then um, we'll have today's training out there later. If you are looking for uh, something that was maybe from the prior year, like I mentioned, the migration training, uh, there is a section at the top here. So to review from 2020, click here. And then also 2018, 2019. So if you ever need to go back, just look at the top of the page and that'll get you there. And then when we go back, uh, let's see. So here's the migrations one. So we can click here to go to the recording link. And this is gonna take us to the YouTube. <laughs> and um, let's go to, so this would be, it would be at the beginning for you. Um, so this will take you to the training um, specifically that you've picked, but here's where I want to go. The SSDT channel, you can get to just by looking it up on YouTube, or if you wanted to come here, you know, if you started on one video and you want to see what else is out there. Um, we've been doing a lot of work lately to get these organized. Um, we've been updating, you know, kind of the headers, working on the playlist. So if you uh, have some extra time and um, you know, want to turn on some, some trainings. Um, sometimes I know with like everyone learns different, but sometimes, you know, you might even put this on in the background while you're doing something, or if you, um, you know, have a certain topic and you want to come out here, um, but the playlist organized things. So here is all of these videos and there's 42 of them in here are for USSR. Uh, there is one that is for just everything that is uh, redesign. I, be I believe I'm not seeing it right now, but um, 
Oh, here it is. Yes. So then these, and it says there's 36 and that's where we're kind of moving some of this stuff around still. Um, but you know, you could click on the redesign playlist and get a mix there. Uh, so that is um, all out there and available to you um, if you need to go back. Let's see. Okay. So the other thing I want to look at, let's just go to a new page here. is the newsletters. So you probably see the email that comes out each month, um, comes from Michelle, and that actually goes out to um, a list that, that goes out, excuse me, to district, to district staff too. So that one is, um, you know, for you and for IPCs. Uh, but if you did want to look back maybe at a newsletter, you know, maybe there was something that uh, you remembered, you know, reading an article about and you're trying to reference that, you can come right to this newsletters page and you'll get a full list. Uh, you could even search this and um, uh, actually maybe that's searching everything, but <laughs> so uh, what you could do though is you could come back through here and um, check. So I think, let's see, well, we have, we're on March right now, but I'm pretty sure it was Okay, well, April, so here's certification reports. Um, and so you could come through and see any of these newsletters from, um, you know, any of these, any of the ones that are out there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show, so, um, I actually, I forgot to show while we were on the newsletters, but I, I did want to note that all of those newsletters uh, over on the sidebar does show uh, the status of the migrations as well. So if we come down here, redesign status, so we can see how many sites are currently live on redesign. Um, and then the total districts participating in this wave. And then there is a direct link to the current list of the districts um, and their status. So um, this is kind of kind of cool to see um, the progress and where everyone is at. And that again, this is sent right to districts as well. So um, you know everyone can kind of see where um, where it's at. Okay. And let's see. Um, the last thing I just want to show in here is something that um, as fiscal support staff, you might not use all the time, but I found this, it is helpful. It may be something that, you know, you're working with your technical team on, but this redesign technical documentation, you may need to come in here every once in a while. And um, basically the place that I go when I'm looking through here is the how to articles. Um, so some of this stuff is a bit more on the techie end as far as like backing up or installing um, updates. But the reason we were in here yesterday was configuring this SOAP service. And so just having this information available with these how-to articles, even if you're not the one doing all of the steps, being able to kind of see, you know, some of these things because the usernames, you know, um, setting this up, this might be the part that you do. Uh, you know, with setting up the emist user uh, to be able to connect or, um, well, and actually, so here's the SIF part for emis and um, let's see, this, this also is done with kiosk as well. Um, so there is a section, I believe, somewhere in here regarding that. Uh, let's see. Um, And then I, I feel like I thought there was another one that, that I was seeing, but um, I lost it. I don't have it in my notes. So, um, but, but again, this may be somewhere that may be helpful. And also, I mean, maybe you're not coming out here and looking at this um, just for yourself, but sometimes if you put in a ticket, we will refer you to a specific article there. So just so you know um, that that exists and um, you know, that may be something that you find yourself in sometimes. <laughs> um, okay.
So uh, that's all I want to go over in the wiki. If you um, do have additional questions, please throw those in the chat. Um, the last thing that I just want to say real quick is um, we have been sending out the CEUs and then the evaluation form um, and it also it contains feedback. Um, so you'll get that to your email after the training and you have um, gotten them for the last couple of days as well. Uh, we talked to Michelle with kind of some of this mi miscellaneous stuff um, about like if we should do um, more on accounts receivable since that is new. And Michelle did a training, uh, I want to say it was in like August when the accounts receivable module came out. So again, that's in the recordings and available to you. Um, but if there is something like if you would like to have another accounts receivable training um, or specific parts of it or anything like that, if there is more that you want to see on that, she asked that you put that in the feedback form. So when you get that email and get that evaluation, um, there's a section um, where you can put ideas for their trainings. And certainly um, if you have other other things that you might want to see in a future training, we do take all of that feedback and use that to form our training schedule uh, for future years. And, you know, we have those couple spots that we are um, still kind of ironing out. So um, any suggestions you have, please let us know. Um, but I'm not seeing any questions rolling in. So um, unless there is anything that you guys have, that's it. We did it. We made it through the um, overview trainings. So thank you so much for joining us this week. And um, hopefully we will see you on the next one. Have a good day. Thank you.